so, um, so I work on biological materials, and this is really one half or 50% of what we work on. So I work on musculoskeletal tissues, which are internal to the body, things like cartilage, bone, intervertebral disc for medical applications. And then the other half, which I'll talk about today, are exoskeletal materials, which are external to the body. And even though they are, they are quite different in many ways and the motivations for studying them are quite different, um, there are parallels among them in terms of the fundamental materials constituents, um, but the applications are quite different. So for this project, which sort of became a very large part of my group about 10 years ago, it was heavily um, inspired by the military. It was funded by the military, by the Department of Defense in the US, and so I spent many, many months with soldiers and with the military as well, which was an amazing experience. And so, um, so I start this sort of talk by showing this beautiful picture. And actually, having come here, it was very ironic because this animal, this picture, actually really started our whole journey down this looking at exoskeletons. And it started right here in Paris, France. Um, so I just happened to have a French graduate student. And we were, we were always interested in biological materials just because of the amazing complexity and the fact that biology is so far ahead in design, in precision design, than regular materials that my career at MIT started in, with biomaterials. But it was about seven years in when my student, who came home for vacation, went to a museum and he was studying seashells and different types of sort of normal type biomaterials. And he started talking to the curators there and they brought him out a little um, skeleton and he brought it back, home, back to, to MIT and showed it to me. And so we, I opened it up, we both opened it up, and it was, it was actually stunningly beautiful. It was, um, it's really gold, and um, this is the actual um, one he, he brought. And um, so this is, and I always ask people, what do you think this is? And I get everything from a snake to, you know, every kind of animal. So this is actually an armored fish, one of our favorite types of materials, are very rare, they're quite rare. And this particular fish is armored in a way that um, it has a very, and I'll show you the material, it has a really special exoskeleton. It's completely 99% ceramic, but it's made out of uh, exquisite ceramic. It's made out of, I would say, the toughest biomaterial that exists called Ganoin. Um, the second toughest sort of biomaterial that exists, like that grows naturally, if you think about it, what is that? It's actually the dentin on your teeth. And so this material, ganoin, is a really tough, advanced form of dentin that actually is a, so this fish, Polypterus senegalis, is a living fossil, which means that it never, whoops, never evolved from 500 million years ago. So 500 million years ago, when everything was armored, everything was in the ocean, everything was armored. And this fish never evolved. It was sort of trapped in estuaries in Senegal. And so the armor stayed the same. And um, if you ever go to these museums of natural history and you see these massive um, skeletons of uh, ancient, giant ancient fish, it's the exact same armor, except there's a fish that lives that still has that armor. It's exactly the same. And so, um, so we started with this beautiful animal and found out that there were living ones and we were able to get them living. So we, for many years, we had many live animals in our lab and, and uh, all with different types of exotic exoskeletons. So when we started working with the military, and as, as I mentioned, spending a lot of time with the military and understanding all the, the needs and the shortfalls of both body armor, vehicle armor, um, uh, all kinds of different aspects of armor and so, so many issues with them. We really um, decided on what species we wanted, stu wanted to study, and we studied a variety of species. Um, but these were the three sort of key areas that they had emphasized to us, which, you can, which are pretty intuitive. Um, so transparent exoskeletons, and we found out that there are actually animals with completely transparent exoskeletons. Actually, we had them in our lab. They're not just transparent exoskeletons. They're transparent everything. So it's really hard to see them in the tanks <laughs> because they're completely transparent. And so sometimes they'll have a little speck and we'll be like, hey, there he is. There he is. Um, 
And so we have transparent exoskeletons, flexible and dynamic exoskeletons, ex exoskeletons which are highly rigid locally, but yet uh, very flexible to, to the body. And so, you know, traditional armor are large plates, Kevlar vests, and um, they highly restrict mobility. And they also have other mechanical issues I'll go through. Um, and then extreme excess blast was a big one over the last years. And so we've studied systems that actually have blast resistant internal uh, exoskeletons in their bodies. And so, so if you look at the range of exoskeletons, there are millions and millions of species. And we really targeted species for, for these kinds of design principles. And most of these are very much outliers. So you can go to the beach and find seashells, which are actually extremely tough. Um, and you can find you know, tons and tons of stuff. But these were very specialized for the properties that we wanted to, um, to study. So you know, for example, um, and these are all ones we've had in our lab alive. Um, we had polypterous Senegals, which I'll, I'm going to talk about polypterous today, which is an armored fish, um, giant mollusks, crustaceans, echinoderms, transparent um, uh, uh, oysters, and our little favorite guy here on the end, which is the Bombardier beetle, um, which we've done a lot of interesting, interesting work on, a little bit of crazy work on that. Um, so when I came to MIT, um, I came and built for the first few years an expertise. I was really interested in atomic scale mechanics, um, molecular mechanics, and atomic scale mechanics. So my first few years at MIT, we built up a whole library of methodologies on how to measure both properties and structure down to the atomic level. So we built up a whole suite of methodologies. So essentially, there was this whole field of mechanical engineering. So I did my thesis half as a physicist, half as a chemist, and half as a mechanical engineer. And so for you know, probably three years of my thesis, I did all macro mechanics. So basically, what we did my first three years at MIT was duplicate that all at the atomic level. So we did lateral force microscopy, dynamic mechanical analysis with a one nanometer amplitude of resolution. We did um, adhesion measurements. So we used atomic force microscopy. And then we built out both the computational and the experimental methodologies for about 10 different um, things by shrinking down what we knew in, at, um, at the macro level. And also, we used a variety of other instruments. We bought lots of instruments. We still have them, um, you know, nano indenters, all kinds of things. So my first few years were really, really focused on, wow, we have these amazing new methods to study quantitatively mechanical properties of materials. And we have these thousands of interesting materials that could never have been studied before, since you can see the pieces are all weird shapes. They're tiny. Um, and even though people had read about these and had books and books on ships going back to the 1700s, um, no, there, was there was no methodology before that to actually measure them. So it opened up this whole, whole new area. So then as we started, and we published lots of papers on down to single crystals, uh, single atoms, single molecules. We did a whole bunch of stuff there. But very, very quickly realized that to understand the full functionality of an exoskeleton, if, in particular if we wanted to design one for a human, um, that atomic was good, and you needed to understand atomic, you needed to understand molecular, but you really needed to understand the full length scale. So, so materials, biomaterials are multi-scale, hierarchical, but they go, ev I found out even beyond that, you have to connect to much higher length scale. So material science, and so this was a very interdisciplinary Project. So material science is, is sort of reflected on the left, and that's sort of the, the framework that's been in existence for about 50 years. Um, and so that's sort of inherent materiality. We combined many other fields, multi-scale computational modeling from mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and bioengineering. And then more recently, even going beyond the lens scales up to the full animal, we decided to start looking at the full animal biomechanics. At that point, in the last five years, we had to add a whole bunch of methodology. So we, we started doing synchrotron x-ray at Argonne National Lab, 
um, we started doing micro, fantastic microcomputer tomography, which was fantastic and amazing. All kinds of, we, I started having architects in my research group, so I have three architects, and they started doing, we, and then we started pushing into additive manufacturing, 3D form finding computation, and, and also in the evolutionary biology section, we found actually that there was a baseline mathematical methodology that would mesh actually very well with mechanical engineering. We started combining those two together. So we essentially created this integrated framework, transdisciplinary framework. So after studying many, many species of animals, we found out basically that there were very, very complex design principles that ran the function of these. So these are some ways that armor is designed. So if you take that first picture that I showed you of this exoskeleton, there's actually a, a very complex multi-layered structure. And each one of those sort of five layers is a nanocomposite material. Each one of them has very well-defined constitutive laws, has very, very robust interfaces, and that all interfaces with the morphometry of the whole, sh the morphometry or shape of the whole exoskeleton. So, when you get a penetrating attack on, and there's some really interesting things when you see this, when you have a penetrating attack on a, a natural armor, it will never fail at an interface because nature has reinforced those interfaces chemically, mechanically, physically, in all different ways. So there's n that's an issue with real armor, delamination, you will never see a failure at an interface. What happens is, is that you dissipate all the energy into the material. We also found universal design principles in the crystallography. Like every animal pretty much had the same type of crystallography in the outer layer. Um, and I'll get to the morphometry as well. And so we, we published all these papers that sort of touched on both universal design principles and then also specific design principles. So there were very specialized design principles underneath some of, within some of these as well. So here's our favorite fish, Polypterus senegalis, microcomputed tomography, which is an x-ray technique that gives you full 3D visualization of the entire thing. So Polypterus, we were able to get alive in our lab. They're about this big. Um, and the, the, the amazing thing about Polypterus, so Polypterus has the toughest armor that exists. It's this ancient fossil. So we started with the, the one that had the toughest. Um, and yet, it, so the outer part of Polypterus is 99% ceramic. Um, it's hydroxyapatite based. And yet, it is completely flexible and fast. And it's really tough. So the first time I, we do surgeries, we do surgeries on the fish. So we put the fish, fish and other animals under anesthesia. And we have a little surgery kit that we go in and we remove the armor. And by the way, it regenerates within two days after you take it off. Um, but the first day, the first time we, we went to Harvard and we were being taught how to do the surgery, and they gave us a regular surgery kit, what they do with their fish. So we brought it back to MIT in our lab. We were trying to duplicate what they were doing, and we took the scalpel, and the scalpel, the metal scalpel, just broke off. And um, so the only way we could actually uh, get the armor off was using a power saw. <laughs> Um, and that's how tough the material was. Of course, we had to be really careful not to injure the fish, but uh, that gives you a sense of how tough these, uh, the armors are. And it's because there's a very complex configuration of materials. So with our very, very tiny atomic probes, we were able to take an individual scale and test the mechanical properties across the whole scale and do the simulations. And so one of our biggest discoveries that we found which was really of interest to everyone in the armor industry was that, um, so when you have a regular military a ceramic plate and it gets shot at, if you've ever seen one, what happens is, is that that cracks radially. And so that's very damaging because um, for multi-hit capability because then it's damaged in other areas. So almost every single armor that we've come across in nature does not do that even though it's 99% ceramic. So if you think about it, you take a ceramic plate, you smash it on the ground, what happens, right? It goes into a million pieces. So what happens here is when you do a penetrating impact here, it actually doesn't radially crack. It actually cracks in a circle right around the site. 
and it dissipates energy into the page. And so it has this uh, defense mechanism of a multi-hit, inherent multi-hit capability. And so it was really, really interesting to do all the theory behind why that is. So like, if you change one of those layers by a few microns, it reverts to radial. If you flip two layers, it reverts to radial. So nature has pretty much come up with the exact optimized design principles to have this done in many, many species. So this is actually one armor unit on Plipterus. And it's actually one of the most complex structures that enables Plipterus to be so flexible and fast. So we have a tank that's probably a double the size of this um, TV. And when we had him, he, he passed away recently. Um, he uh, would be on one side, and sometimes the grad students would um, scare him and he would just appear on the other side. It was like so fast that it, you couldn't see, see him swim. So he had these spurts. And so they're so flat, fast and flexible and yet completely covered in ceramic. So there's a lot of complex features here. Um, the architects who work in my group said that they would have never figured out how to come up with this. It's a very unique structure in terms of the curvature. In terms of the pe there's a peg and socket that have a really unique um, shape to it that allows certain ranges of motion. Um, and then these sort of go together. So we do this whole morphometric analysis of these. Um, and also that varies along the um, body of the fish of where, what kinds of biomechanical mobility you need. So for the fin area, you can get very, very flexible mobility. You can have very, um, thick, heavier armor on the, where the vital organs are, and you can see the whole diversity there. So we basically mapped morphometrically the entire fish, and you can see quantitatively all of the different um, features. We actually used a whole methodology for mechanical engineering and brought that to this field of evolutionary biology as a way to understand very heterogeneous morphometric variations in organisms. And it was a beautiful mat mesh of theories and computation and mechanical engineering that fit perfectly for this um, project. And we published it in a, in a journal that sort of crossed boundaries. And so it was really a beautiful study. This, this was done with Mary Boyce um, at MIT and our joint student. This is a beautiful picture of the fin. So the fin area, you can see, has all kinds of custom designs, heterogeneous seams that allow for different functional regions. Um, and it's a really gorgeous picture of, of the fin area. So then we, what we did was we did computational design um, to create bio-inspired armor. And so these are some of the methodologies. This was both with Neri Oxman in the Media Lab and Mary Boyce and some of our students. And so we had to do local, meso, global, um, first with the design of the unit, then how to mesh it out, um, et cetera. And then we take this and we actually 3D print up them. And we can actually cut out morphometric features and do different things. It's a very, very cool methodology because you can take things from nature and then you can figure out by, just by deleting it in your computational files and your printouts um, the role of different morphometric features. And, um, I think I have a there where we tested it. So one of the great things about this is that it really behaved, the macro scale armor mechanically behaved exactly like the, um, the fish armor. And in particular, there were many directions where the stiffness essentially went to zero. And so we call that mechanical invisibility. And that means that you get full protection with not feeling zero stiffness on your body. And um, that was one of the big, big discoveries. I mean, uh, the army came to us 10 years ago and was like, we need a t-shirt that stops a bullet. I'm like, okay, we'll see. Well, getting close, getting close. Um, so yeah, so basically we can figure out ways where you can see that the stiffness um, can go to zero, but yet your protection is still maintained. And these are other areas that we've worked on. So 
armor with embedded optics in it, where the optical component is the same exact material, just structured differently than the surrounding armor. Um, armor with photonic layers in them that can be seen five miles away. Completely transparent armor that also has that circumferential cracking, which is great for windshields and riot gear and um, blast protection. So we've looked very, uh, believe it or not, there are animals which undergo true blasts um, and have protective devices for them. And all of these have been published in one form or another. The optics one was on the cover of Science a few months ago. And um, the beetle was also in Science. Photonics was in Nature Materials. So, um, so yeah, there was a whole array of studies in these areas. I just wanted to end on one thing and mention I know this is a big transition, um, but I recently stepped down from my role at MIT uh, this summer after almost 20 years there, and I was, I was the dean of the graduate school for six years, and I'm on leave to start a new university. And so uh, over the next few years, I'll be working on trying to create a new research university that restructures the pedagogy, the departmental structure to focus more on transdisciplinary research, on project-based learning, and also on a low-cost, sustainable financial model. So if anyone is interested in that, I'm doing that simultaneously. I still have my lab at MIT, but um, my primary, I'm on sabbatical now, and I'll be on leave for a few years, is focusing on building the new university. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christine.